Coming up next is Dr. Kimberly Taylor. Here's your chance to talk about what matters to you. Although you will receive helpful advice from Dr. Taylor, remember, this is not to be construed as a form of psychotherapy, diagnosis, or treatment, and cannot replace a therapeutic relationship with a mental health professional. You can reach Dr. Taylor by calling 564-1290 or toll free at 866-564-1290. You can also listen live on the internet at drkimtaylorshow.com. So here now is Dr. Kimberly Taylor. You may have heard it in the news. There's an epidemic that's going on across our nation, and it's happening in our colleges and our universities. And today, we are going to be putting campus sexual assault into the spotlight. One in five women are sexually assaulted while in college, and most often, it's happening in her freshman or sophomore year, and in the great majority of cases, it's by someone she knows. And most often, she does not report what's happened. And though it happens fewer times, men also are being victimized, and they are the least likely group to report sexual assault. Today on the show with my guests, we are going to find out not only what is driving these statistics, but also what we can do to prevent them. If you have children in college, or if you are a student in college, you're going to want to stay tuned. Just recently, the White House has raised the public pressure to a whole new level, and it is issuing new requirements for colleges to both prevent and to respond to sexual violence on their campuses. It was through Title IX, which was the federal law that mandates gender equity on campus, that is now requiring universities to take the necessary steps to prevent sexual assault on their campuses and to respond promptly and effectively when an assault is reported, or they're going to risk losing their federal financial assistance. And all this is happening because college universities nationwide are facing a whole wave of complaints from sexual assault survivors who are alleging that their schools are violating this federal law by discouraging them from reporting assaults or even underreporting assault statistics. This issue is so alarming, and for parents out there who have students who are either in college or whether they're planning to send them off to college, this is a scary statistic that is happening out there, let alone what females must be thinking these days while they're thinking about going away to college and worrying about their own safety. It's 55% of female students and 75% of male students who are involved in acquaintance rape who admit to having been drinking or using drugs when the incident occurred. And this alone is making victims really hesitant to call the encounter rape, not just because of the stigma that they don't want to have attached to them of being a rape victim, but some will experience such crippling guilt and self-blame after the assault because there was drugs and alcohol involved. Also, many of these survivors know their assailant, and they fear that they're going to be retaliated against or they're going to be isolated from their peer groups. And the truth is, is that the surveys show us that even when a survivor tells their friends about this sexual assault, they report often that their friends don't believe them or even blame them for the assault and engage in what's called victim shaming. And the survivors who do speak up, who go to the police, say that oftentimes the officer's emphasis on the difficulty of the reporting process often discourages them from even filing an official police report in the first place. So as far as I'm concerned, colleges have a long, long way to go to instill an atmosphere of no tolerance for sexual assault on their campuses and to be able to provide a safe environment that's necessary to help victims of sexual assault. And as parents, we need to step up our own education to both our male and female children about consent and respect in the emergence of this whole hookup generation and the mentality that goes along with that. There's a national survey, actually, that reports that 46% of teens continue to say that parents 
are the ones that most influence them about their decisions about sex. Well, it's only 20% that say it's the friends and media that are the most influential. So parents, we still are the strongest influence on our children's decision about sex and sexuality. And bottom line, it's always going to come back to parents educating their children and teaching respect and responsible behavior. Whatever your message is going to be to your children about when to have sex, there can be no doubt that we must teach them to have mutual respect for each other and to always, always ask for consent. We also need to educate our young men about what constitutes sexual assault and to educate them about consent. When a woman says stop, they have to stop. And whatever they've heard, guys can control their impulses. And to imply otherwise is just offensive. Teach them that sexual excitement is one thing, but it doesn't justify forced sex. And if a woman is drunk or unconscious and cannot give their consent, then we need to teach them to take care of this person instead of taking advantage of them. We also need to teach that alcohol and drugs are often related to sexual assault. And when under the influence, it's going to compromise everyone's ability to make responsible decisions. I think there needs to be a strong message out there that we do not shame our victims, but we do and should shame the perpetrators who prey upon others. Now, you may think that this topic... It's just the current news cycle and that it's going to go away or that it doesn't happen in our town or on our campuses. But I have to tell you that I have been dealing with this issue in my private practice with many young college students, both male and female, who are very confused and traumatized by these unwanted sexual assaults. The only thing that amazes me is that it's taken this long for the issue to become national news. Today, my guest is Deborah Beasley. She works in the field of sexual assault prevention, and she's joining me from West Virginia University. And we're going to get into what can be done today to change the direction of these alarming statistics and what we may need to do to help to prevent them. So if you have a question, if you have a comment, if you have a story that you would like to share, I want you to give me a call at 564-1290 or use the toll-free number at 866-564-1290. Stay with me. I'm taking a quick break, and I'll be right back with my guest. I'm Kimberly Taylor, and you're listening to KZSB AM 1290. You are listening to Dr. Kimberly Taylor. You can reach her by calling 564-1290 or toll-free at 866-564-1290. I am here with Deb Beasley, and she is a licensed social worker, and she has spent this last 16 years working with sexual assault uh, prevention. And her primary job these days is, uh, and for the last four years, is counseling sexual assault victims and those that really care for them. So welcome to the program. Thank you. What we have just had in the news is that the White House is out there now really pushing for our colleges to survey students and to ask about sexual assault as part of the need to bring about this rape prevention campaign. So they are wanting uh, colleges to not only uh, curb the violence, but also to have a place for students to be able to come. But the truth is, it sounds that right now it's fewer than 5% of, of all of these uh, victims actually report sexual assault. Can you explain that to us? Why so few report? Yes. Um, it's a combination of different things. The, the, the first being these are people, many of them, 18 years old, having left home for the first time and are, are young, immature, and aren't sure how to report, aren't sure what to do. Other reasons include that the majority of the assaults are acquaintance, and this may mean that um, in that red zone, that first six to eight weeks in the fall, 
that they're trying to make friends, they're trying to become part of a group, and then if assaulted, that means they lose that group, um, if, that, if it should be an acquaintance from that group. So a number of different, like, social factors going on and um, immaturity and, Okay, yeah. plus is, it is a very closed environment within that campus, and there oh, is yeah. not a lot of o- oversee about what is happening. What do you mean? Well, um, kids are free for the first time from their uh, parents. Oh, yeah. And yeah. they get involved in the party scene, and they want to fit yeah. in. And so it's kind of a very closed group where yeah. these kinds of things uh, happen, but they don't want to tell on their friends, and they certainly exactly. don't want to talk about what's uh, going on because they think that the parents may take them out of school. And I have heard these words. I would appear to be a failure if I told my parents I had been in assaulted. Uh-huh. I would be a failure as an adult. Right. Which is bad. So wrong. But And is it true that in most of these cases there's drugs and alcohol involved? My experience is yes. I think the most recent um, statistics say about 75 percent, but there's no question that someone that can't defend themselves, uh, they become more vulnerable when under the influence. Okay, and when they're under the influence, for everyone involved, they're going to be a whole lot less responsible. Oh, sure, yeah. sure. And, and the law says that under the influence of alcohol or drugs, you cannot give consent to have intercourse. So it's, um, it, 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 in, in terms of a culture and a community, we say it's wrong, period. If someone's under the influence, they can't consent. Mm-hmm. But, you know, so we're speaking loudly about that, but it still happens. And you did mention this when you first spoke that for most of these cases, these people know they're a attacker. That that this is somebody that they really know. It, it has been a friend. They've talked to them, or it's somebody that they know of. Yeah, two thirds of the time it's somebody they know. Thirty-eight percent of the time, this is a recent study. It's actually a friend. Hmm. So um, this is where also this gray area of mixed messages steps in. There's no question in the parking lot of a department store if you're grabbed by someone you've never seen before. There's no consent, period. But if it's someone that you've been hanging out with for a couple of weeks or, you know, you've known from class, then, you know, people start developing excuses about, well, you know, I'm sure I didn't know. That's the thing. And most of this is happening at the parties. It isn't necessarily on a a date, but most of all in parties, or is it really happening in both yeah. cases? And and it's sort of funny because when I talk to students and I say, are you guys dating? They say, eh, that's not really a commonly used term. Right. That's you and me. But, you know, it, uh, it doesn't... Um, you're right. It's called, you know, they're hanging out or they're at a party or somebody offers somebody a ride home. We find about 33% of the time it happens in the victim's own room. Certainly, more than half the time, someplace where they thought they would stay. What are the uh, students saying to you about this whole hookup environment? Does it excuse it? Does it make it more acceptable somehow because of what is happening or what is expected out there of them since they're not necessarily dating? I, I I think to a certain extent it's getting more confusing mm-hmm. because I'm thinking of a recent, um, well, I talked to a student and she was assaulted and the first time she told a friend of hers what had happened, her, her friend said congratulations. Congratulations? That it was fun that she had had intercourse. She had no idea that the woman was a that, or, or that it was non-consensual, I should say. So one was seeing it really as a rite of passage, that this exactly. is just what, what does happen. Exactly. And Congratulations once... that you have had, you know, an intimate relationship with this man. Mm-hmm. And when, in fact, it was non-consensual, and it was horrifying and traumatic. And we may be in a culture where you don't ask about things like that. Mm-hmm. Consensual. You just assume it was, consensual, you know, that, that she wanted to. That's, you know, not the case. 
Well, it seems like from the young girls that I see that once they start to either drink and or use drugs, that there's this kind of self-blame that they put on themselves so that this can uh, happen, but they are not likely to report it because they feel so right. bad about themselves. Right, right. They will sit across from me and say, well, I think it was kind of my fault because I did get kind of drunk. And, you know, for me, that's mortifying because to drink too much means you have no experience with consuming alcohol. It has nothing to do with this person could do that to you when you were vulnerable. It just doesn't make sense. So but. what is it that we need to tell them about whether or not they're uh, drinking or uh, using drugs, that if someone engages in sexual acts with them without their consent, it's not their fault? Correct. But I, and I don't want to leave it unsaid that we certainly, all of us, can reduce our vulnerability. We can reduce the likelihood that something might happen. I mean, we could uh, not drink or drink little. We can have friends around. You know, there's lots of things we can do to reduce the vulnerability, but when that doesn't work, that doesn't make it our fault. Okay, so this kind of gets into how to party smart, right? Yeah. Okay, mm-hmm. so so that each person has to own some responsibility about what they're doing also. And if, in fact, they are getting into trouble when they do drink, that they also can look at that as just a way to protect themselves. It does not let someone else off the hook if they have raped them, but it does let them gain some sense of uh, control that they can take back their power in a way that they cannot put themselves into uh, situations in which they lose their ability to consent. Okay. What are some other tips for smart dating? Well, first of all, you know, we don't have to party. We could do other things besides party. Yeah, (laughs) but it's, but it's, but it's college. It's on a campus. I know. Yeah. I know. And, and we're always encouraging students to do other things besides pick up a beer because there are so many other neat things to do. But I know how available it is, and I know how easy it is after a long day to pick up a beer. Mm-hmm. But other things they can do, I, I think there are a very significant number of my clients after the fact have said things like, you know, it was a little voice. My gut was telling me, or when he made that joke about, you know, women and objectifying women and she's just another one and, or, or that sort of thing. Or when I heard how poorly he treated his last girlfriend, I just, you know, my gut told me. Mm-hmm. Um, that's one thing we lose when we're under the influence is, is that, you know, that connection to our gut. Mm-hmm. Uh, we also need to trust it and listen to it, which is something that the junior or senior has, freshmen may not have. Mm-hmm. Okay. That thrust in their gut and their ability to know that somebody's just not right or some situation's just not right. Okay, and I would think to stick with their friends, to know where yes. your, your ride home is, that you're going to ride home oh, with, yes. with a friend, that you don't take drinks from others, that you hold on to your oh, own absolutely. drink. Okay, things like that. You know, like we that. push an app called um, uh, Circle of Six. I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's a free app you can put on your phone, and you just push a button, and somebody you know, will call you back or pick you up. You're connected to friends. Okay, and, and, what, and what, what is that app called? It's called Circle of Six. Okay, great. Yeah, there's a there's a TED YouTube on it. If um, if you want to learn more, if your listeners want to check it out, it's terrific because you take six different friends and you connect to them in, in two pushes of a smartphone. A smartphone. So we are going to take a quick break, and I'll be right back. I'm Kimberly Taylor, and you're listening to KZSB AM 1290. You are listening to Dr. Kimberly Taylor. You can reach her by calling 564-1290 or toll-free at 866-564-1290. I'm here with Deb Beasley, and she works for the West Virginia University, and she spent the last 16 years working in sexual assault prevention. 
Um, Deb, there are many factors that really contribute to an environment in which sexual assault exists. What do we need to do as family, as friends, as parents, teachers, advisors, therapists, et cetera? What, what do we need to do to make sexual assault less acceptable and to really challenge that attitude? Well, I, I, I think mostly what we need is a lot more uh, Dr. Kim Taylor shows. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, we... Um, We've reduced, I just found a statistic today that said that we've reduced the number of sexual assaults on campus by half since 1993. So the more education, the, the, you know, the more we're going to reduce those numbers. But I think a big piece of, of why we haven't reduced numbers faster sooner is that we're talking about sex and there are an awful lot of mentors, coaches, teachers, parents that don't talk about sex. They're not willing to say this is inappropriate or that's inappropriate. You don't have to do, you know, they just say don't do anything. It's sort of, you know, they stay away from it. They're not comfortable with talking about it. But the sooner they start talking about it and and allow young adults to say, no, I want this or no, um, yes, I'd love to do that. And be very honest about what they want, don't want, the better. Well, and you've worked in this field for a, a number of years. How often uh-huh. do you actually hear the male voice of males telling younger males about sexual assault and about not doing it? Oh, not often enough. That's why I think things like high school coaches, oh, it's huge whether they, uh, you know, uh, uh, talk of women in derogatory terms or objectify or they, you know, they teach the guys on the football team or the, you know, the chess players, it doesn't matter that they should be respectful. Mm -hmm. Because all of behavior is learned. Well, what I don't get is that it is probably the male voice that needs to be heard and that these are their daughters, their sisters, their their uh, future wives. Three or four percent of the men do 96 percent of the assault. I don't understand why 96 percent of the men don't really angry that if they walk behind me at night, I'm going to suspect they're a rapist. Mm-hmm. That's not fair. Mm-hmm. They should get angry about that, but they don't. I mean, I don't see enough. I'd love to see more. Well, there is a new PSA out with Daniel Craig and a few other actors on there, which is sending a very strong one, but it's been a long time in coming. Yes, yes, absolutely. In the work that you do, do you really teach what consent means? Yes, Uh uh-huh, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. In fact, we've used the Green Dot program for a couple of years. And that's all about being a bystander and, and saying, hey, that's not right what you do, and I'm going to help her. Stop what you're doing, that kind of thing. You know, stepping up. Okay. It needs to be really clear to students, and it does need to be taught or retaught, but that someone who is incapable of giving their consent, that also means that they haven't given it, and therefore that if you uh, proceed, that it is going to be rape, and therefore it is going to be a crime. Right. A felony. And that being drunk is n- is no excuse. Correct. And I, I sometimes use the analogy of, uh, you know, when you were driving that car, you can't say, oh, I didn't realize I shouldn't drive. I was really drunk. Mm-hmm. That doesn't suffice. <laughs> right. Right. Same thing. So what do you tell students about giving a, or receiving mixed uh, messages? What is the message um, there? Well, I think there's less of it now, but there is still that... Um, problem with um, good girls don't say yes. They're supposed to say no. And I strongly recommend people say exactly what they want and and set their limits and be very clear about it. It's true that men can also become victims. Oh, very much so. Okay. Do you know what the statistics are about that? 3% of men, 1 in 33. 1 in 33, okay. And it's 1 in 5 women who will be sexually assaulted on a college campus. And I think the percentage of men that come forward is like 1.1% or less. I mean, it's far less often that a victim, a male victim will come forward than a female. Mm-hmm. What do you think is the best way to teach about setting clear sexual limits? 
I think it's it's giving permission to kids to talk about it, parents to talk about it and say, this is what I want, this is what I don't want, and creating a, a culture where we're going to back each other up when we say we're going to do one thing or the other. Do you work with the parents also of someone who has been assaulted? Not always, because sometimes students don't want to tell their parents, but um, oftentimes I will talk with parents. And what is it that parents can do that will be helpful if their child has been assaulted? Lots of parents at first get very, very angry, and it's because their baby's been hurt and they're just overwhelmed. They don't know what to do for their child. But beyond that, I encourage from the very start that they take the lead of their child, their son or daughter, that if they say they want to um, stay at school, let them stay at school. If they um, don't or do want to start therapy right away, then encourage them to do so. But um, to return the power to them that they lost from the assault and to believe in them so they can believe in themselves is really important. There are a lot of uh, reactions that victims will will have. Can you speak about the emotional impact of this? First and foremost, which um, I know you're real familiar with, is that trauma piece. Mm -hmm. The fact that when they got up that morning, the world looked one way, and then the next morning after the assault, the world looked entirely different to them because they had no idea someone could do something like this to them. And from that, they go through the stages of, of trauma, but they'll, they can turn using alcohol, self-harm or injury, depression, nightmares, eating disorders. You know, how do they internalize or how do they um, try to understand what happened to them? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Body memories is another thing. Gosh, you know, wherever they might have been hurt by the assailant, that seems to hold on sometimes for, for even years. We are going to take a short break now, but when I come back, I'd actually like to talk about just some of the rape myths and what the facts are, because I think that's going to be helpful, too, in this process. Stay with me. I'll be right back after the break. I'm Kimberly Taylor, and you're listening to KZSB AM 1290. You are listening to Dr. Kimberly Taylor. You can reach her by calling 564-1290 or toll-free at 866-564-1290. We are talking about sexual assault on campus, and the truth is is that nationwide, campuses are facing a wave of uh, complaints from sexual assault victims who are stating that their schools are really trying to discourage them from reporting assaults, as well as that they may be under-reporting assaults that happen on campus. I'm here with Deb Beasley. She works for West Virginia University, and she is a licensed social worker, and she's been working in the field for years with sexual assault victims and how to prevent it and how to help those who have been assaulted. So, Deb, I'd like to go into some of the myths around rape, because I think those are very important to go through. The first one is, when it comes to sex, men can be provoked to a point of no return. What an insult to men, huh? Isn't it? (laughs) (laughs) That's akin to some sort of lower animal. I don't don't even know where that one comes from. That's just like, that's an insult to every man I care about. Well, and I think it's very archaic in that it is something that is kind of in the myths, and it has been out there, and it's given them an excuse as to why they don't stop and can't stop. Like it's her fault once again. Yes, because she turned him on. Yeah, sorry. All right, so the next one. If a woman goes to her date's room on the first date and implies she's willing to have sex. No, no. Got to ask, 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 talk about it, talk about it. But, Deb, there, I, there are lots of people who would say she was looking for it. She should have known that if she went to his room that this was going to happen. You know, I've, I've, I've known women that said, I, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to. And he says, well, come on, let's just go play video games or let's, we'll just stop by there or something like that. And she said, well, we're not going to, we're not going to, we're not going to. And he still rapes her. Mm-hmm. Be clear, 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 but 
I think our gut has to tell us when things feel a little fishy also. but Well, and still, to go back to that if you don't have consent, it's a no. Oh, yes. So here is the next one. When a woman dresses provocatively, she's asking for trouble. I just love this one. What do you, <laughs> what do you have to say about this one? <laughs> well, when I ask students about this, um, the conversation usually ends up with, She's not dressing for him. She's dressing for other women anyway. Okay, so women are not out there asking for it is the whole point in all of this. No, of course not. Okay, it's, here's the next one. It's not really rape when a woman changes her mind in the middle of a sexual activity. Oh, yeah, it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I, you know, we each, men and women, have every right to say, stop, don't do that to me. Uh, whether whether it's intercourse or it's, I don't know, a- anything else, I'm salt. We, we can say, no, stop it. And getting back to that, having parents teach mutual respect, that, yes, they have to talk to their kids about what consent is, and if they're going to choose to engage in sex, that they have to be thinking about things, and they can't use somebody else and to disrespect them in a way just to make themselves feel good. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, and the the other thing I think is helpful as parents or coaches, mentors help with is the fact that we don't have a very good language for this sex thing, and we don't like someone we love say, would you like to have intercourse? We have all these goofy little names, and we have nonverbal innuendo, and we need to learn to say, are you asking me if I want to, uh, you know, we have to be... We have to teach our kids to communicate more clearly. Mm -hmm. Asking what's going on and also telling people, no, I'm not interested. And asking permission. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. To really understand that's not your body to use, it's somebody else's body, and they get to give you permission. Oh, yes. So here is one of the other myths, that if a person doesn't fight back, he or she wasn't really raped. And I think this has a lot to do with how some of the victims feel, that if they didn't yell loud enough or Uh if they didn't fight hard enough, that somehow it's still their fault. So what do you say about that? And and the vast majority, my experience anyway, the vast majority of the time, the victim does not scream, kick, tear, rip, or whatever else, you know, they might show on me. Because what happens is the brain goes into a, um, I can't believe this is happening to me. Oh, my God. Mm-hmm. goes into this, you know, freaked out, traumatized, um, catatonic sort of state that you can't fight back because I can't believe this is even happening. Mm-hmm. We are telling our daughters and sons that should somebody do this to you, you should do this to them. We don't even talk about it. Yeah. That's why, you know, some say that self-defense classes are wonderful. Yeah, even if we don't teach or remember what they teach us in the, in the self-defense class, they do teach us that we should have the confidence to know that if we have to, we could hurt somebody and get away from them. But the vast majority of, of young people going off to college at 18 don't have that kind of understanding. We have a call that is here, so I'm going to take that call. Hi, Ann. This is Dr. Taylor, and I'm here with Deb Beasley. Do you have a question for us? Yes, I do. I would like to go back to the uh, idea of men not speaking out about uh, sexual assault, especially public men. And there's quite an analogy to the kidnapping in Nigeria of the 300 girls. That men, that government of men, did not really speak out very loudly until the news went worldwide. And they were mm-hmm. embarrassed, I suppose, into starting to get organized to find out where these girls are. Same kind of thing here about sexual assault, where the, the public men, the men who have a voice, are not using it. And I just wonder why. Well, and this is my point. Deb, do you, do you want to start on this? Because I think that I could go for a very long time on this one, but I think I'll let you go first. <laughs> Uh, absolutely, I agree with you that, that public men could um, um, could speak out uh, much more strongly. A few do, um, but it's not a pretty topic. 
And I'm afraid that sometimes people think that if they're going to speak out about this issue, that someone's going to think that they were assaulted or that they, you know, assaulted someone or there's something, per- you know. So I think sometimes they're worried that it will be an association that's not good for them. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Maybe. Yeah. Well, I think that there are many points that we have to try to address with this issue is that we have to educate parents to educate their kids. We have to help the colleges to have a no sexual assault a tolerance policy in place. And then we have to be able to work so that those who are truly a victim, that we help them, that we don't shame them, but that we turn it around and we make the perpetrators address the shame that comes with that. So that what I too feel is that in order for it to really turn around, it has to stop being women that are standing up and saying this. It has to be the men standing up beside them and saying it to the young man, because that's the voice that needs to be heard, that this in no way should be tolerated by anyone against any other person. Uh, We want them to be the majority, not the minority, those that uh, speak out. Exactly. So, Anne, thank, thank you very much for your call. What should people do if they have been sexually assaulted? What are the first things and the first steps that should take place? Well, if it's, if it's happened Less than, say, 92 to 100 hours ago, the best thing to do is go to an emergency room so that an evidence collection kit can be done. In the state of West Virginia, uh, we do that at no cost to our victim, and they do not have to file a report at that point. They can, it is a, they can do a no-name kit while they think about whether or not they want to bring charges. But it's important to get that evidence collection kit done. So should you want to bring charges, you have the physical evidence you need to move ahead with it. From there, to get some kind of relationship started with um, a therapist or an advocate can be helpful, helping you negotiate through the criminal justice system or to help get mental health care. Or maybe there's long-term medical care needed should someone be exposed to HIV or other STDs or become pregnant. So it's kind of getting connected to the system and all the resources hopefully will come right to them. And what would you tell friends who have been assaulted? What can friends do? As, as difficult as it is, be there for them. Just be there, be there, be there. And like with parents, allow people to make their own choices. Don't be judgmental. Never helpful. Um, to to say, I told you you shouldn't have worn that shirt, or to tell someone they should have had that last drink um, is not helpful. That's really only hurtful, and that adds that sense of um, blame. But to um, be there whenever they call, to be in their circle of six, to, you know, be willing to pick them up from the library when they get frightened at night, that kind of thing, that would be important. So in this current culture of uh, hooking up where it really does confuse a lot of the boundaries, since you're the one in the schools working with the students when once they leave home and come to school, is there some message, something you would like to say to parents before they send their kids off to school? Talk to them about this issue. Talk to them about the alcohol and the drugs and don't, don't assume that your child won't be exposed in some way. If only, you know, people living down the hall are going to, you know, bring it home with them. But talk to your children about it so they're clear and they're comfortable. They're not so shy that they can't say, stop that, take your hand off me. They need to know this stuff before they go to college. All right, Deb, I want to thank you very much for uh, coming on the air today You're with welcome. us. Thank you. And I think that just talking about this topic helps, that we need to educate a, a variety of people, but we need to keep this a conversation going. So thank you very oh, much yeah. for coming on, and we'll be right back after a very short break. I'm Kimberly Taylor, and you're listening to KZSB AM 1290. I do want to thank my guests, 
uh, Deb Beasley. And if you would like to reach her or if you would like to go to her website, you can simply go to my website and I will post all of that information on there. She has some great tips on her website um, for people who are assaulted and or those who are trying to help them. We really need to make a big shift in our uh, society so that we do not let sexual assault perpetrators believe that this is okay. And we have to stop shaming our victims and instead shame a culture that creates an environment where perpetrators can exist. I want to thank you for joining me today, and I welcome any comments or questions that you might have. You can email me at drkim at drkimtaylorshow.com, and you can now go to my website to find out how to download my podcast on iTunes, or you can listen to previous shows. So just go to drkimtaylorshow.com. It's all there. This show will also be rebroadcast Thursday at 10 p.m. and Sunday at 9 right here at KZSB AM 1290. I want to thank my screener, Sandy Jacoy, and Richard Dugan, my uh, engineer. I'm Dr. Kim Taylor, and I will be back here next Thursday afternoon between 2 and 3. And in the meantime, have a great week, and let me leave you with this thought. Nobody else has to change in order for you to get better. Be the change that you want to create. You have the power to do that.